Let's talk a bit about artificial intelligence. Now, this is a presentation that I had given for the annual Czar Business School Mixer event, which is a dinner and an event with the graduate students as well as some undergraduates who attend um, and, some, and the faculty as well as some business leaders. So I'm making a recording of this so that we can use it for our completely remote IT 241 class. Regarding artificial intelligence, this presentation will cover what is a neural network? What's the essence? What's the, the fundamental of, a, of a artificial intelligence? What are neural networks? How do they work? How do they evolve? And we'll talk about some of the major AI platforms that are out there, the major vendors, as well as some applications, applications specifically for the education sector and employment. We're going to touch upon healthcare a bit in this presentation. We have a, another presentation specifically, a deep dive in healthcare, but it's not this presentation. This is sort of an overall look at AI and the various ways it can be used. And what does AI mean for students, faculty, researchers, and university corporations? Some research caveats we'll talk about, and we'll touch upon AI uh, coding, programming, as well as robotics uh, in the future. So what exactly is a neural network? What, what is it, how does it work, and how does it evolve and self-improve? So neural networks mimic the human brain's neurons and synapses, that's the first thing. So there are nodes and connections that mimic our neurons and synapses. And they have weights and parameters, which are sometimes called genes of the neural network. So how does a, how does a neural network evolve? If you look at the graphic on the left-hand side here, you can see there's lots of neural networks involved that are mimicking the brain. So the way they evolve is that neural networks compete using a process called NEAT. We'll explain that in a second, what the, what the acronym stands for. It mimics a natural selection process that uses evolutionary algorithms, programs, to select better genes for the next generation of neural networks. Now, successful parents, successful neuro, uh, neural networks are combined and they have offspring networks that inherit, inherit their successful genes. Now, NEAT also allows for some random genetic changes to introduce the, uh, the advent of functional changes, because as you know, in, in biological evolution, you have to have some randomization to introduce a change, and the changes that are advantageous propagate and, and, and as, because they're more successful. And here's what NEAT stands for. If you look the, towards the bottom of the screen, neuroevolution of augmenting topologies is the exact uh, term that represents the acronym NEAT. There's also a function or some set of algorithms called a reflection, spelt a little differently, as you can see in the bottom of this slide. And these are algorithms that look to simplify some of the neural networks so that they're more efficient and have a higher performance. So by now, I would think that you've all have used ChatGPT or at least have heard of ChatGPT, but I think you've all probably used it by now at this point. ChatGPT, the foundation of it is GPT-3. And there's another version, GPT-4, which is out commercially available, um, much, much more capable. But first of all, what does GPT stand for? It stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. So a transformer is essentially a set of programs that transforms data, collects data from these large language models, collects all the data, and generates new information, new paragraphs. That's why it's called Generative GPT. Now, if you look at this, the black graphic in the middle of the screen here, you see the little green arrow that I added points to a small white dot. That's the number of parameters in, Ch in GPT-3, the foundation of ChatGPT. And then the, big, the, the blue arrow points to the very large white circle, which shows the number of parameters in GPT-4. So it's very much, it's much more capable, it's much, much larger in terms of its capability. And in the next slide, we'll see exactly how, that, how these two compare with some examples. So Microsoft had a presentation and they wanted to compare ChatGPT, which is based on GPT-3, with the newer, more capable GPT-4. And they gave both systems this problem. And I'll read the problem to you. I have a book, nine eggs, a laptop, a bottle, and a nail. Please tell me how to stack them onto each other in a stable manner. GPT-3, or ChatGPT, failed fairly miserably. If you look at the, miserably, miserably, if you look at the red arrow, it says, place the eggs on top of the nail making sure they are balanced and not tilting to one side. Now, it might know the definition of what a nail is, but it doesn't really have a common sense understanding of its characteristics. To, to, because look at the, the way it provided an answer is pretty absurd. GTP4 was very different, and that's the orange arrow below. Its answer was arrange the nine eggs in a three by three square on top of the book, leaving some space between them, and it goes on and on a little bit more in a more logical way. And it seems to be expressing more of a common sense understanding 
of how to solve this problem. So very different answers. One made no sense and one is kind of pretty fairly logical. So that's the difference between GPT-3 and GPT-4. Very different. Now we just saw how much more powerful GPT-4 is in comparison to GPT-3, but it's not perfect and it makes errors. And these, and these errors are sometimes called hallucinations because they fabricate out of whole cloth completely different facts. So in this example, in this Microsoft presentation, they gave GPT-4 this problem. Take seven, the number seven, multiply it by four, add eight, times it by eight, and what's the result? And at first, GPT-4 says the result is 120, 120, and then it goes through and shows exactly how it made the calculations. And then at the bottom, it resolves to the number 92. So the tester then responded, wait, as you can see in the middle of the middle uh, paragraph, the middle sentence in this uh, slide, wait, but you stayed, but you st started by saying seven times four plus eight times eight was 120. And the answer that GPT-4 gave, that was a typo, sorry. The correct answer is 92. Now a typo, you know, this computer is not typing anything. There's no keyboard here. It's just, it's creating answers. So it's kind of creating an answer that makes no sense again for uh, for an AI machine. It's not typing anything. Uh, now maybe it's insecure, it's de developing human attributes and it's, it wants to say it was a typo, it was an accident. But we know it's not a typo because it didn't type any answer. It's just calculating it in this AI, out among these AI algorithms. So there's a caveat here. There are still errors in AI, obviously. And um, again, some of these errors are, are well, sometimes are called hallucinations. And I'll give you another example. Uh, there, there were some tests where they asked about bi the, bio the uh, biographies of certain individuals, and it would just add degrees they don't have. So where did these degrees come from? It's a hallucination is what the term is, and it's adding information that doesn't exist. It's creating it from nowhere. Uh, so we have to have a bit of a caution, a cautionary note, and probably in the future as well, oh, we should have some sort of cautionary note with all these AI machines. And of course, in the future, as we get to concerns about what the data is and bias, and you know, it gets very complicated. But that's another conversation for you know, another class. So we talked a bit about OpenAI's ChatGPT, right, based on GPT-3. It's a large-scale language mod model and it creates human-like text but it has no information past December, 2021. So it's still very limited in the sense of uh, its answers because it doesn't really know what's happened after December of 2021. Now, Microsoft has invested very heavily in open AI in that company and they own part of it essentially now. And they're going to use it's at the GPT-3 engine and probably the GPT-4 engine in the not too distant future as part of its Microsoft Bing search engine. Now. I, most people don't use Microsoft Bing search engine day to day. They use Google or other things like chat, like um, DuckDuckGo or Brave. There are other, lots of other options, but it hasn't really uh, been embraced by many people. So Microsoft wants to change that by adding artificial intelligence to its search engine so you can get these nice summarized answers and not have to look at the results and read them all and try to compile answers yourself. Now, of course, Google is not going to wait for their search engine search engines have become obsoleted so they've created bard ai b-a-r-d and bard ai is their own version of ai and it's you know pretty sophisticated they're rolling it out as well um and but it will also be able to search the internet so it should be able to not only have information from stored databases but also glean the internet search the internet for more current information and put that together for its results as well um, of course if you look Further on the left-hand side of the screen, there are others like uh, UChat and ChatSonic, which is real time, and there'll be others like Amazon and IBM, Tesla, uh, XAI and TruthGPT, Badu is the Chinese version. Uh, so these, there will be many, many uh, AI uh, foundational platforms, of course. If you go to the right side of the screen, not only are we, do we see the competition between Microsoft and Google, but if you look below, there's also OpenAI code Codex. And OpenAI Codex allows for programming. You could actually give uh, OpenAI problems in English and it'll create text for you. It'll create, not text, programming uh, syntax. It'll actually program for you. So it's been, it's been very useful for programmers to help them expedite that programming to get the very fundamental code developed that they can put into, into uh, the OpenAI Codex system. So it's really interesting. And then of course there's Dolly 2, which again, this is an OpenAI product. 
you give it some text and it creates pictures that look almost like photographs based on the text. So it's essentially, it's a text to image uh, solution. I went through the internet, I couldn't find, I was looking for something that would be very unique. I couldn't find a picture of cats knitting socks. So I asked Dolly2 to give me some pictures of cats knitting socks. And within, I'd say 30 seconds, I had four, not perfect, but I'd say 98, 99% perfect. There's a couple of glitches in the pictures, but they look like photographs of cats knitting socks. I went into Google and some other search engines like, like DuckDuckGo, and I couldn't find any examples out there. So it did create it. I don't believe that it found it on the internet and displayed it. I think it did create these images really sort of interesting. So these are the basic platforms, but there are going to be lots and lots of companies developing applications using APIs. If you look at the bottom of the screen, application program interfaces, APIs are toolkits that come with these platforms, these AI platforms to allow developers to create their own applications and using the APIs connect to these AI modules. So the AI module uh, can sit beneath new applications for a variety of things, whether it's healthcare or engineering, chemistry, biology, these specialized applications can use the resources of these AI platforms, access them through APIs, application program interfaces. So let's look at some of the common ones that are out there, some of the, the popular products for a variety of solutions. Let's start with healthcare. So healthcare um, has a, a very popular Pro, uh, electronic medical record system vendor called Epic. And in fact, many hospital systems, in, including Northwell, is moving now to Epic. And they hope to have the 26 hospitals on the Epic electronic health record by 2026, somewhere in there, maybe a little bit later. And then, and then after that time frame, then implement the physicians. So what uh, Epic has done is they've partnered with Microsoft OpenAI to have um, summary charts created from OpenAI within the electronic health record. Uh, we'll go into detail, much more detail on that in a different presentation for healthcare, but I just want everyone to understand that there is a an alliance or an agreement, a contract between Epic and Microsoft to embed artificial intelligence in their electronic health record. Below that, you could see Microsoft has uh, the 365 apps, you know, Word, PowerPoint, Teams, Excel spreadsheets, and they're going to also interface that to the to OpenAI so that you could have some sophistication of AI within these products. It would really be interesting to see how that works. Um, and then below that, there's a different product uh, called, uh, uh, again, this is will be working within Microsoft's Bing's search engine called Visual Chat GPT. And what Visual Chat GPT is, you give the artificial intelligence engine a photograph. This example is a photograph of an anvil, a heavy weight, being held down by being uh, lifted by balloon, being held down. The balloons are being held down by the anvil, by the weight. And the question they gave to the uh, uh, the AI engine is: Here's this photograph. What would happen if we cut the strings? And the so now the AI engine has to look at that photograph, make some sense of it, and figure out an answer for that question. And it correctly said the balloons would fly away. So it's interesting that you could give the AI system not just uh, text, but a photo or an image and have it analyze the image and come up with an answer to a question posed about that picture. On the right hand side of the screen, you'll see something called Tome. Tome is really interesting. And if you can see, I'm not sure if you can make it out, but it says right below Tome, it says AI in healthcare introduction. I had asked Tome, the Tome creates presentations for you, kind of like PowerPoint, not PowerPoint, but like PowerPoint. And it's also free. You can try it out yourself. And I said, I gave it a couple of sentences about I wanted to see an AI presentation about um, AI being used in healthcare. And within a minute or two, I had seven slides with original art. Uh, not that I would use the art that it created necessarily. And the text is very high level. It wasn't really detailed enough to use really for presentation. But it's a starting point. It's a way to you to start a presentation quickly and get something that you could then build in and add some detail and have a real presentation that's useful. Below that is Adobe Podcast. And Podcast really what they did is they created a number of different applications uh, for podcasters to enhance their voice. So for example, it can take a, a background noise and eliminate it. Uh, even if somebody's remote dialing into this uh, podcast Adobe suite, somebody may be in an airport or in a noisy location, and it can eliminate that background noise and have a nice clean presentation for your podcast. They have some other tools for podcasters. I think it's going to be very interesting what Adobe is doing for podcasters. 
There's also NVIDIA. You may have heard NVIDIA, very sophisticated chips, graphic chips used not just for gaming, but for AI and very sophisticated uh, uh, algorithms. And they also have something called broadcast. And broadcast, what it does is real time, look at your podcast or look at your video. And if, you're dis if your eyes are distracted away from the camera, it'll move your pupils and your eyes to look like you're always being focused on the camera. It's kind of an interesting uh, application. And then finally, in the bottom, there's something called 11 Labs. And 11 Labs, you give it text, you select a voice, and it creates a very human-sounding voice. You can introduce a presentation with it, which I've done in the past. You can uh, use it for a variety of different uh, uh, podcast uh, scenarios where you want you don't want to use your own voice, but you want to use a natural-sounding human voice. And you can add that for your podcast or your presentation on YouTube or Rumble or any of the other uh, very popular uh, sites. Uh, uh, I guess Spotify's only uh, uh, voice except audio, except for Joe Rogan, who gets uh, gets to get video on on Spotify. So really interesting applications, and there'll be obviously many, many more as time continues. But I thought these are the ones I'd like you to uh, to be aware of, particularly Microsoft. Just think of what how Microsoft with AI embedded in Excel spreadsheets can, can give you an answer. It, you can ask it to do this calculation and then also give you a, a summary solution perhaps about what might be the next steps based on the data. So it's gonna be a very interesting world we're, work, we're leading into here. All right, so let's look at some of these other applications. Here's where we get into deep fakes, where the industry is going to need some sort of digital signature, some way to authenticate the audio, the pictures, the videos that you're seeing on the internet or that are published wherever. Because uh, the deep fakes will be a problem. So voice AI in the top left-hand corner here uh, gives you the ability to change your voice or any voice to sound like someone in their uh, in their catalog, a president, another a president's voice or a celebrity's voice or some official's voice. Um, and it's, it works live. It works with recorded voices. Uh, it's actually pretty interesting. You're allowed one free uh, voice a day for voice AI for the product on the top left. We get to the top center, we have Google DreamX, and DreamX allows the ability to take a video, like in this example, there's a monkey eating a banana, and it changes it and generates a bear dancing. So you really don't know what you're looking at anymore when these, these deep fakes uh, start to be used and, and published. NVIDIA has something here in the center on the right-hand side in the middle, NVIDIA introduces text to video. Type in a story, it creates a video, pretty interesting. Uh, below we have replica and replicas for a person if you need someone to talk to you had a rough day in the office or at school or whatever and you want to talk to a companion uh, there's a there's a, a replica application i'm sure there'll be a lot of variations on the thing with this then the left hand on the bottom you have three um, runway ml stable fusion and mid-journey these are all very sophisticated podcast software has the ability to again create pictures from texts um, and really manipulate videos in a very sophisticated way so we will need some way, I think, to have some way to, to produce, produce authenticity or, or uh, associate authenticity with the videos, pictures, and audios of the future, considering all the deep fakes, all the deep, all the deep fake software that, that exists that will exist. Of, of course, students will be using AI, and they should be. And we, I think we should be encouraging that. And for students, there are a couple of specialized products. I don't know how well they work, called Cactus as well as Google's Socratic to help students leverage AI to do their homework and, and find solutions. And of course, we have to challenge students, I think, for uh, more complex um, problems because they will be using AI and they're using it now, actually. Um, I've, I've, it's not very obvious with some of my students. Uh, but also, there's a product called Poised, and Poised is sort of an electronic version of Toastmasters. If you're familiar with Toastmasters, it's an organization where you could go and practice public speaking. And I encourage all of my students, particularly my undergraduates, to join a local chapter of Toastmasters to get that sort of experience because it's very important for your career. Now, this is sort of an electronic version of it. It's listening to your speech as you're going through, whether it's PowerPoint or Zoom. And real time, it's giving you advice like you're talking too fast or you're using too many filler words like um and uh. Um, I think it's pretty good. I haven't spent a lot of time with it, but I did use it for just to see how it worked. I think Toastmasters is probably better because you're in physically with people, uh, although I guess that's becoming more and more rare and everything's becoming more, uh, the meetings are more and more electronic. But I just wanted to give you a sense in the education setting, the education uh, sector, uh, what some of the products that are developing now. 
For those that have technical careers or IT careers, programming careers, there's a site called Geeks for Geeks. And Geeks for Geeks has a number of tests. They've collected tests for the Amazon uh, tests when they uh, screen folks for employment, Amazon, Samsung, Microsoft, etc. And um, you can use AI as you practice. Uh, you may even be able to use AI during the test. I'm not sure. We'll see how that evolves. But um, there are people who are using uh, AI to uh, help them train themselves or help them answer questions when they're going through these tests and when they're practicing uh, to take a test. I do encourage my students. I encourage them to use AI, ChatGPT. Uh, you have to learn it. You got to. You have to learn it for work, it's particularly for your graduate students, where you might be writing papers, whether they're research papers. And in my video on healthcare, we're going to talk about how there are some researchers using ChatGPT to help them do their sort of basic fundamental research. But I think we should encourage it. Uh, there are products out there. The second paragraph speaks to products like Turnitin and CustomWriting.org that try to determine whether a text is created by AI or by a person. I've worked with some of these. I find the results are fairly mixed. I'm not sure that's uh, that there'll be good solutions for this, and I'm not sure we want to look at that. I think we need to, um, as the third paragraph says, we need to consider offering more assignments that are more focused on complex critical thinking challenges. People should use AI. It's a tool. You'll need it to be competitive. You need it at school. You need it at work. Um, and I think our challenge as, as uh, educators are to make the problems and the challenges in the research papers more, more difficult, with more, more complexity and maybe more aspects, more features, that uh, more detail about various pieces, because you can get that information more quickly through AI as, as opposed to re researching it on your own. There is a research caveat. Samsung programmers had some new code they were having some difficulty with, and they put it into ChatGPT, uh, only to find out they're really giving ChatGPT some proprietary secret intellectual property, this new code for Samsung. Um, so there's a bit of a problem that sort of raised the red flag on how people use AI. Uh, let's look at the next slide. It's a letter that I received from one of my customers, cu customer slash partner, uh, about this particular issue. And um, they sent a letter to every one of their developers, uh, all, all their employees, all their accountants, their IT developers, and to all their partners and, and uh, you know, subcontractors like myself. This is the letter that I received from my customer slash partner that I work with. I redacted some information because I didn't really get the legal approval to give it out with their name and uh, any other details. But they do reference the problem with Samsung, as you can see by the top arrow here, uh, that Samsung had this problem. They encourage private learning of AI, which, which I do as well. But now they're going to require approval for business use. So if you're an accountant or if you're a uh, programmer or you're doing something and you want to find some solution through an AI system, you have to get approval from for that uh, use of uh, AI for work. And of course, there's also this um, the final arrow here. You need to exclude corporate and client intellectual property. You have to be careful not to give that away. Now, I think after getting this letter, I realized university researchers face very similar IP risks, any researcher in any industry. So whether you're in healthcare or other science and technologies or history or whatever you're working on, you're giving the, the seeds of your research, the ideas that may be unique to, ch to another company to open AI as you enter it into ChatGPT. So I think we're going to need some bookends and some guidelines in every industry in terms of how ChatGPT or how AI is used, essentially not ChatGPT, but AI generically, how it's used while you're doing your research. It's probably hard to predict how the synergy of robotics and AI will be working, but uh, OpenAI is using ChatGPT5 with this company called 1X Technologies to create a humanoid robot, robotics type Android called Neo the summer of 2023. Of course, Tesla, Google, others are also working in this direction. Where this goes and how quickly it goes, I think is anybody's guess. But I think AI robot, ro robotics will have the potential to provide immeasurable benefits to humanity in every industry. And should be able to take dangerous jobs away from people and more laborious tasks that are routine and tedious. I would think those would be the first places where you might see robotics replace humans. 
For those of you who might remember, in 1988, there was the Morris worm, when a worm is a very sophisticated kind of a virus that propagates on its own without any human intervention, or without any humans doing anything to help that propagation. Now that we have AI as a reality, we're concerned about what would happen to AI if it becomes uh, you know, malicious or in some way malevolent towards humanity. Will it become sentient? Does it, will it understand that it exists? Will it know that that it exists? Will it be aware of, it, will it be aware of its existence? So there's this concern of a, of a possibility of a totalitarian AI regime uh, controlling us. Now, before that happens, I think that's a possibility. That's you know a whole different debate. I think before that happens, we're going to start seeing in the nearer future uh, when AI becomes so sophisticated that super intelligence uh, ASI, uh, artificial superintelligence, can do creative things, can, can be the best scientist, can be the best uh, physician, the best uh, mathematician, the best biologist, the best chemist. You know, where, where's, where does it take human, humanity in terms of our passion, our desire to create and, uh, you know, to work and find new solutions and to be passionate about pro solving problems that we that are part of our lives? So I'm not sure where that is going to take us, but I'm, I'm a little concerned that it will have an effect upon humanity in terms of our role as you know, the leaders in the, in the world that are pushing forward for, with, with innovation if they could be overshadowed by an AI machine. Not sure what that means for us, but it's a whole nother conversation for a different sort of class in um, AI policy. Well, uh, this concludes our presentation. As you can see from this slide, these are the topics that we touched upon. And as I said earlier, there's another presentation that I'll, I have for our IT241 class, which goes through healthcare in a lot of detail with some really interesting uh, uh, topics to, that are reviewed in that presentation.